Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Abner Chin. I am an Israeli expert in farming and floriculture. And I've been doing some projects in uh, India and uh, abroad. Uh, today's talk, I will uh, start with uh, try to answer why. Why do we grow in hydroponics and why we want to grow uh, cut flowers? That is the uh, topic of my uh, uh, talk today. Uh, uh, usually and naturally, we start with what? Farmers uh, ask what to grow, how to grow. But the biggest question is why to grow? Why to grow? Why to, for example, why to grow broccoli sprouts? sprouts? You see, broccoli sprouts, as I've uh, stated here, contain the compound called sulforaphane in abundance 10 times more than broccoli itself. So if you want to have sulforaphane, then you should grow uh, sprouts and not broccoli. Okay, so this is the whole idea of why. Now, in my lecture also, Whatever I'll tell you now, it is what we believe in Israel is to adapt, not to adopt. And there is a small difference. When you hear things, when you see things, when you learn things, you adapt to your conditions, to your needs. And we do not adopt directly as we get it from outside. Now, the lecture will also is a kind of a ruler, a footpatti, right? It is the things that you take from here, you have to modify and make it suitable for your condition and your place. So this is the issue. And the next slide, I would like to ask the question for a few seconds, what is this? What is this means? This, you see this uh, thorn. Here you see a flower. Here you see mirchi. Here this is a, what is this? We'll talk about later and all about this also. So what is this? So what we think here, this is not a thorn. This is a cut flower, iringium. This is not a flower. This is vegetable, zucchini flower. This is not a mirchi. This is sweet pie. It's a sandwich we put inside stuff with omelet or paneer and send the children to the school instead of gluten and wheat, okay? And this is potatoes, of course. You see here the cows are eating vegetables and men, people also eat vegetables. And so what is the difference here? The difference here that animals and cows specifically eat according to their stomach. We human being eat with, with our eyes. That means we eat only, uh, we like to eat things that are attractive, that looks nice. So it is very important to understand what the consumer wants. And that is what we try to give it. So I go back to my question, what is modern agriculture? This is a picture from my farm in Pusa Institute, the Indo-Israel project, the first one. What is modern agriculture? I'll give you a few seconds to think about it. And it would be nice if you think and, and try to discuss with you among yourself, what is modern agriculture? The slide that I've shown before, it has some uh, 
things to think about. Okay, I won't delay you too much. And I will give you our answer, Israeli answer. What is modern agriculture? This is modern agriculture. If we define modern agriculture as fashion, that means we, at least uh, most of the world or India is self-sufficient in food. We have enough food, but are we delivering to the consumer taste? You see, we are, we are growing potatoes that don't look like potatoes. It is full of uh, antioxidants. We, we are growing various kinds of tomatoes, cherry tomatoes. Now, if you, if you deliver only red tomatoes or if you deliver only yellow tomatoes, that is not enough nowadays. You have to give the tiger tomatoes and the oblong tomatoes and the pear-shaped tomatoes and the date-shaped tomatoes so that people want new things. People want the people are fed up of the same. And that's what I tell my farmers. Don't do more of the same. Do things differently. Okay, so this is the main uh, preaching of me. When I come to farmer, I say, think differently. Do things that the consumer will want. The consumer needs. We have to grow what the consumer wants, not what we, it is very easy for us to grow. So this is the philosophy part. And now I come to the cut flower business. These are the flowers, the most popular flowers in India. Uh, that is Israel and India is my expertise. And this is uh, chrysanthemum, roses, carnation, Gerbera, lilies, and gladiolus. Okay? What I think that this is not enough. These are, I call it, the old-fashioned flowers. Okay? Roses is, is very popular. Roses has its own advantages. The most preferred flower on the day of picking is roses. Two days after the picking, the rose drops its head and it's not popular. In local market, roses are very popular in Israel too. But we are talking about the variation in cut flowers. You see so many variation of cut flowers. Even sunflower is a beautiful cut flower. You see, Hypericum, Solidago, Gypsophila, Anemone, Lysianthus, my favorite flower here. Looks like roses, but of shelf life of two weeks. So the consumer wants to buy flowers that won't drop its head after two days. And tulips, of course, Trochelium, Feonia. Okay? Now, Sorry, you see uh, greens, cotinus, limonium. I see now that India is growing limonium, ranunculus. Okay, then we have aconitum, aster, and eryngium, as I showed before. So you see, we have to deliver to the consumer choice. If we go on growing the old-fashioned flowers, it is okay if you are happy and you have a local... But I preach for export because when you do a project, you cannot build on local market. No feasibility study is good enough if you rely on local market. You have to rely on export. You have to plan for export and make your uh, project for export. Then you know what are the quantities you are going to grow and what is the price more or less that you're going to get. So this is my uh, ideas about cut flowers. This is what we have to grow. We have to 
there is hundreds of cut flowers now that are very uh, uh, in demand for floriculturists, the flower designers, for all the occasions. So this, this is what we have to show. We, this is what we have to give them. Here, when I was uh, working in uh, cut flowers in Israel, I was head of this uh, branch in Israel. And at the peak in 2007, we, we exported 1.5 billion flowers. And gradually it came down. And recently it is, the quantities are very small and I'll talk about later. But see the flowers, Aster, Asparagus, Asclepias, Aralia, Kala, Gypsophila, Gerbera, Pitosporum, wax flowers. Roses and other flowers come into others. Carnation, Ruscus, Lilium. So you see, these are, I cannot put all the flowers in the table, but you see other flowers, we at the peak exported 133 and more flowers of extra other flowers. So what happened? What happened in Israel? That cut flower is coming down. Now see the situation in Israel. Yeah, uh, last year, we have only 382 cut flower farmers, 70 pot and bedding plant nurseries. From the 1.5 billion, we have come down to 350 million stems exported. I believe the domestic market is the same all the year round. So for at around half a billion flowers are in domestic market. And why this is happening in Israel, even though we have various flowers, we have uh, beautiful uh, flowers, good uh, keeping quality and everything. The reason is farmhand. We, uh, we pay in Israel $1,200 per month for each person working. Basically, we have Thai workers that come all over from Thai for two, three years, and they, and they are treated properly, and they give and they get good salaries. Cut flowers, for example, a farm with cut flowers needs 10 farm hands. So a business of cut flower has to be very, very good and very, very uh, um, profitable to pay $12,000 per month for salaries for the farmhand. I will come to this point later on in my uh, talk. The disaster of cor Corona, you can see here, it's a little bit in Hebrew, but But cut flowers, no business, no, no uh, weddings, no uh, gatherings. So in Holland, they threw all the cut flowers to the garbage and we had to pay for the garbage also. And here you see uh, in 2020, the, the, um, uh, the, uh, the, price, the, the money we got for selling cut flowers in Holland, in Dutch, flower auctions. That is a total disaster. I hope that it will pick up now. But 2020 was disaster for cut flowers, the Israeli cut flowers for sure. Now I come to the other topic of our main talk of uh, hydroponics. You see, sometimes the farmers are tempted to do hydroponics without real reason. The question is, why to do hydroponics? And the bigger question is, why to do vertical farming? Okay. We'll talk about the difference between vertical farming and, and horizontal farming. Okay. Later in the next slide. But here I, I found a nice uh, table here to show. 
you see there are there are crops that take 6 to 8 weeks and these are mainly the leafy vegetables you see when we come to the uh, uh, vegetables it is going up around 2 years a, a uh, at least 1 year of of uh, half harvesting so i have seen in india vertical farming when there is not necessary so we have to think about these things when we have to grow something that takes 6 to 8 weeks in in uh, hydroponics that is fine if you want to grow it in vertical farming that can be fine i'll tell you what we do in israel but that can be also fine but why to do vertical farming in these things when it taking so much time and there is disadvantages of growing these kind of crops in vertical farming hydroponics is fine enough this is my preference of a greenhouse for india i have done this in in pusa institute this is the uh, this is the project in pusa institute and the the bay is 6.4 meters only and the length and the length of the greenhouse is only not more than 40 so the total volume heated in the greenhouse is is very low related to the openings of the greenhouse all the four 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 walls and the rooftop opening so this greenhouse can take out hot air easily and if you need to heat it then also there is advantage because the volume heated is small this are modern greenhouses that we put nowadays in israel i will talk about this greenhouse later on but see the gutter is about 4 meters we have an apex curtain we have polyethylene strong polyethylene concrete built belt so that the uh, rodents can't come in about electronic fence and patrol road i will talk later this is a greenhouse in construction you see the length of the greenhouse is very small and the openings are big so the aeration is good and that is beautiful for for floriculture now a i'll tell you about israel we believe in horizontal uh, hydroponics even for a this is basil of course in 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 volcanic ash this is the way we work this is my project in pusa how we grow roses we raise the beds so that it will be very easy for the workers to work we put the straws so that we can hold the soilless uh, media inside in israel in israel we use volcanic ash in india it's very easy and it's very good to use coco peat and it is recommended we we can use what is available in israel uh, the volcanic ash is available and it's a good media in india coco peat doesn't fall far from volcanic ash and we can use beautifully coco peat and roses roses in israel has been grown scientifically and most of my talk about hydroponics in floriculture we concentrate on growing roses because we have uh, perfected the grow uh, the uh, protocol for growing roses and mainly uh, the grow the uh, the fertigation part of it so it will be very easy to show Uh, and talk about uh, fertigation in roses it will be an, a good example for other cut flowers that we grow
And this is my project in uh, MIT Aurangabad. Here you see the Israeli pattern, even if it is leafy vegetables, we grow horizontal. In Israel, we don't see any advantage of growing a, even leafy vegetables in, in, in verticals. This is what our uh, long uh, experience is there. We like to grow everything horizontal. We see big advantages. If we have time, we can discuss it later on. Okay, the media, media for hydroponics. As you see, this is the turf that we grow. This is the volcanic ash we grow. Uh, this is the media we grow in Israel. We also grow in cocoa peat and perlite. Okay. Uh, Something similar to the, to the uh, volcanic ash I found on, in the internet, uh, clay pebbles. It looks very interesting to me. I have not checked it, but it looks very interesting to me because we like uh, a volcanic ash of this kind. So this is interesting. I will try to do some experiment in this. I don't like rock wool. Rock wool is for Dutch growers. They are very precise, very good in their profession. And rock wool is, gives very good results. The problem is it doesn't forgive you for any small mistake. The best results I know, I, I know my friends in Holland, they get very beautiful uh, results. But it cannot happen in Israel and India, I think, because even small mistake, you have to pay severely. So this is the rock wool. I don't like it personally, but if you are a very good farmer and a very good experienced one, like the Dutch farmers, it is the best uh, media for hydroponics. Vermiculite, we use it basically for nurseries to mix it with cocoa peat perlite and vermiculite for cocoa peat. Uh, it is a very good thing. We have uh, this mineral in India, in south of India. And I think Varsha is, uh, is the company that is uh, doing vermiculite and it is a very good media. Well, we'll just go fast. Uh, where is where is my pointer? Okay. You see, you take this with you. These are the physical properties of soilless media. We are working with, we call it tuff, the volcanic ash. These are the properties. This is the properties of cocoa peat. And this is the optimal uh, uh, properties that theoretically should be there and rock wool and perlite is here. So these are the things we, we can take home and discuss it later. Now, the fertigation point. I have big experience in nurseries. The whole uh, fertigation issue is based on Hogland solution. And in nurseries and other portions, we like to work in half uh, strength hoglin. And these are the uh, uh, parameters for the macro and the micro elements that we use. And all our, uh, uh, our uh, formulations are based on this strong uh, um, um, solutions that was uh, done by giants before us. Well, very important, I've given you this table, very important to learn these things. I would not like to discuss it now. You have to have these tables when you're working with fertigation in hydroponics. It's very important to understand these things. 
what is the conversion from P to the fertilizer and from the fertilizer to P. This is basics that we have, every farmer needs to have it in his hand. So he understands how he has to make the fertilizers, how to prepare the solutions. So I, 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 I thought it is important to bring it to you because this is a must that every farmer has to have it in his notebook. Okay, uh, there is uh, some uh, 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 details about few uh, important uh, fertilizers. Okay, what is it here? It's a negative ion that is rapidly absorbed by the root. The plant can assimilate nitrate in the root of foliage according to its needs. The problem of this is because nitrate has a ni negative charge, it does not adhere to the soil. Thus, needs attention to application timing and environment pollution because it runs away from the root zone. And sometimes you can, uh, if you are not aware of nitrate, you can uh, irrigate uh, soils of China down under or Australia because it doesn't stay back. So we have to be. But there is an advantage in soil sculpture. In soil, it's a problem. It can be an advantage in, in uh, hydroponics. Ammonium. Well, I won't read everything, but ammonium stays for a little bit longer. Urea, the biggest advantage is the price, okay? Phosphorus, phosphorus in soil is a big problem. It can accumulate. And in Israel, people, farmers that were not aware, the soil became rocky because it, it adheres all the uh, soil particles into one big rock. So when you're growing in, in soil, it is very, very, uh, important. Potassium. I know about potassium of in cocoa peat. There, a, a pota cocoa peat has a, a good quality of uh, potassium. And in when you start growing in uh, in cocoa peat, you have to be aware that maybe in the beginning you won't need potassium, or if you need, you have to be very careful in it. A chelate, chelated iron. You see, there are few, few chelates, and it is very important to know what is the PC, pH that you are working with, and then you have to match the chelate with the PC that you are working with. So there are few uh, chelates that are available. Same with other uh, chelates of, uh, uh, of zinc and coprome and calcium, magnesium, whatever you, it is very important to understand these issues of their sensitivity to pH. Okay, we come to the main point. This is a kind of a thumb rule for any rose growers. And then we, modify it to other crops. In Israel, uh, roses, uh, roses are planted for four, five, six years. And the biggest uh, 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 research and, uh, and have, has been done in roses. So this is our recommendation. This is our recommendation for growing roses. Okay, in, win in Israel, winter and summer are different climates, different temperatures. So in winter, we give on the highest side, on the highest side, uh, uh, the nutrition. In summer, of course, the transfer operation is higher and we reduce these amounts uh, significantly. So this is what a, I think a kind of a ruler to take home and this is a recommendation for roses in Israel. Here, the same table, 
but here we relate to the tap water. In Israel, on average, we have 20 ppm of nitrogen and nitrate. We have few potassium. In Israel, we have a lot of calcium in our water and our soil. If somebody is growing in soil, we have a lot of uh, 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 um, gypsum in the soil. And these are the things. One of the things that is uh, very, uh, very good for growing tomatoes, but not for cut flowers, is chlorine. We have a lot of chlor in our water. 200 ppm is, uh, is a good water in Israel, if you have 200. We have some bore wells in the south of Israel in the, in the desert with 500, 600 ppm. So it's good for growing cherry tomatoes, but for, uh, for uh, uh, roses, I don't think it is. <laughs> I'm sure it is not the best thing to do it. And the other elements of microelements are here. This is our recommendation. I'll show you now a recommendation of what we, you can take it and see it and study this thing. These are our recommendations for preparing the fertilizers. This is tank A. These are the quantities we put. These are, this is tank B. This is the quantities we put. Tank C. And then we inject four liters per cubic meter from each tank. This is a, the cutting edge of fertigation in Israel. This is how we, we, prefer, we like to work with three different tanks. And uh, of course, a pH uh, dependent sulfuric acid as required. And it is very dilute uh, uh, when mixing. Because if we put four liters from each tank per cubic meter, it, it becomes very accurate when you work with this kind of uh, recipe. This is another option for fertigation. And as I said in the beginning, roses as our, uh, what do you call, our guru. For other crops, other cut flowers, we adjust. Sorry about that. Okay, very important thing, of course, in hydroponics, and if it is not hydroponics too, to do a leaf analysis. In roses, diagnostic leaf is the second true leaf of, uh, under the bud. The second true leaf under the bud is the diagnostic leaf. And of course, you have to sample properly and take it to the lab for diagnostic. Desirable, desirable elements in leaf analysis. These are the parameters that we need to have in a healthy plant. Okay. Uh, you see, in Israel, uh, the cut flower business is, uh, is a little bit slow, but the scientists are all working to, to introduce, you know, new flowers that can be uh, domesticated as cut flowers. These are two, only two out of many of the cut flowers that we are either bringing from abroad or domesticating wild flowers from Israel, domesticating them. And one of the things that I would like to say is that uh, 60, 70 years ago, there were no wild flowers in Israel. People had a habit of picking flowers from the wild and bringing them in their wires in, at home. Then we started educating kindergarten children the importance of not picking wildflowers. Now you are, after 60 years, now you are invited to come to Israel. You will see carpets 
of wildflowers, anemone, ranunculus, all the beautiful things, uh, tulips. So tulip was taken from Israel. It's a native flower in Israel and was taken by crusaders to Europe. And Holland now is the, the, the base of tulips. So this is very important to do for cut flowers. As I said, we are walk, talking about fashion and fashion wants new things to come all the time. So this is very important things that we are doing in Israel. Dubium and other flowers. Now I come to the slide I showed you earlier. You see, the cut flower business has come down to 350 million stems exported with 400 million stems domestic market. With the cost of farm hands. The salaries we pay for farm hands is so huge. Now Israel government and Israel farmers are pressing towards this cut flower. And this cut flower is one gram of this dried flower is sold at the farm for 220 rupees per gram. The growth, the growing protocol in soilless culture, in hydroponics, in, in volcanic ash is the same or almost same, a little bit more complicated than roses, but it is that much easy. And only thing is that you need license from the government, from the police, from all the authorities to grow medicinal cannabis. Medicinal cannabis flowers are, are popping up in Israel like mushrooms after monsoon. And this is one thing that just shows us that how we can develop into things that are making money and not to stick to the old fashion flowers. Do things that will be that is that will be sold. And now I want to tell you a secret of Israeli farmers. The secret is very simple. We first sell flowers, then we plant, and then only we plant. This is the secret, and it is so easy to do it. Unfortunately, most of the time we plant, and then we come to Azadpur Mandi and ask the dealer, Babaji Lelo. Okay? Babaji Lelo doesn't work. So this is one secret, and the other secret is we plan all for export markets. Then the feasibility is clear. Okay, here I uh, stop my uh, vision of cut flowers and hydroponics. Thank you and good luck. God bless you all from Jerusalem, city of peace. Thank you and see you. Bye. It is a uh, pleasure to be here and I would like to thank uh, Dr. Sudarshanan uh, for inviting me and giving my views on the soilless cultivation and technique which definitely deserves further implementation. Uh, in some countries we have already quite a bit of substrate growing, but there are also countries, for example India, where there is much more opportunity to use these high-tech systems. Um, I have called my presentation Soilless Cultivation Opportunity and Challenge. And 
in small letters underneath, I tell you that I want to speak about the concept and the practical implement, uh, implications. Now, if you would type in, in Google search, uh, soilless cultivation and link that to opportunity or challenge or concept or practical impl implications, then you will be almost an expert in soilless cultivation because there is a tremendous amount of information. But uh, the point is that uh, what I want to do today is putting it in a context and give it a bit of a structure that we better understand where that soilless cultivation is coming from. All these systems are not uh, falling from the sky one day to the other. It is a long development. Substrate growing is uh, commercially already for 40, 50 years in practice and little by little that has been built up. So uh, we have to learn to work with it and it is not a question which you buy uh, it from the shelf and you start implementing it. Uh, sometimes I mention that for uh, to compare, um, if you are not able to drive a car, I can give you a car and I can explain you that this is the accelerator and this is the brake. Uh, I can explain you everything. Then if I give you the car, that doesn't mean that you can drive a car. That is a thing which you have to learn over time. And that is also with these uh, techniques, the high-tech uh, cultivation techniques, we have to learn how to handle these systems. And that is what I, I'm not able to do this afternoon, but at least I can give you uh, the instructions and uh, make you understand better uh, where it is coming from and how we have to handle these soilless cultivation systems. I tried to get my next slide. Yeah. So here on the right side, we see a uh, modern setup and quite expensive setup in substrate with uh, peat and perlite and on the right side of uh, the slide, you see the, the profile of myself and you see that I have been quite a long time active in horticulture and floriculture. And over all these years, uh, I have learned and got a lot of practice in the different aspects of agriculture and floriculture and then not only uh, let's say in the Netherlands or any other place, but through a number of countries where I've been li living for several years and uh, most of all for the last 20 plus years, I have been mostly in India. Uh, so I'm very well conversed with the Indian context, um, how it is uh, going in India. The agenda for my talk uh, this afternoon uh, I want to go uh, a little bit into the history of agriculture to understand where it is coming from, where we are nowadays. Uh, of course, we talk about the soilless cultivation, um, the opportunities, the challenges, the disadvantages, and uh, the big challenge, the management, what we spoke about uh, not so long ago. Uh, the management should be on top, but we can't talk about the management as long as uh, we don't understand the system uh, very clearly. So let's start with the history of agriculture. We have to start when the agriculture was initiated, and we are talking about um, seven, eight thousand years ago. Uh, that's a long time. But in that long time period, let's say, uh, except for the last thousand years, uh, our forefathers have been laying some uh, fundamental aspects of agriculture. Um, one is that they found out about the seasonality of the plants. 
you can't grow all plants year round and have production. So it is linked to the geographic position and the climate conditions. And there we go with the first aspect of climatic conditions. Moreover, people were selecting plants from the best plants. They were taking uh, the seeds to have improvement. And that with year after year has uh, given a tremendous boost to certain varieties, natural varieties as we call them, uh, which are already at a high production. Of course, we know from history as well that uh, irrigation has been a very important aspect. We know from irrigation channels in Chennai, uh, the Indus Valley, uh, the Arab countries, all these intricate uh, systems of irrigation uh, because that was found to be uh, tremendously necessary for the, for the plants to be able to give water when required. Um, a part of that, of course, uh, seeding and growing plants at the same spot uh, year after year, uh, we understand that now that gives depletion of the soil so we have to do soil management and bring in material to keep the, uh, the soil uh, active and productive. Pest and diseases were also, of course, an important issue for the uh, early growers to keep animals out, to keep insects out, to keep birds out. And nowadays, um, we are looking how we can grow more organic and biological. We are going back to the old ages to, uh, to try to find, um, for example, repellent plants. And we know that marigold and lemongrass and garlic are plants, if you intercrop them, uh, they are useful. So, uh, however old the original system of agriculture is, there are still lots of truths in that uh, cultivation system in the soil. Of course, developments went, went on. The Arabs have done a lot of research thousand years ago. It was taken up or continued thereafter in several Western countries and again in China, uh, where we discovered. Uh, after the uh, further studies uh, and, of course, the genetic studies, we come to the point that we understand genetics and we see how through breeding we can increase the production tremendously by making uh, better varieties. And when we had the better varieties uh, discovered in the, in the early 1900s, uh, we wanted to spread it out over the world so everybody could have an advantage of that. But we also understood that if you don't give the right conditions to these plants and you don't protect them against uh, predators and fungal diseases, then there is no success in bringing in these high productive plants. So there was a whole package of that, fertilizers and spray chemicals and good plant material, uh, and that went around the world under the name the Green Revolution. The Green Revolution was definitely a revolution. The only thing is that later on we found that it was not sustainable, and it was not sustainable in its original form, and the other thing is that the implementation was not sufficiently explained to the tremendous a large amount of, of farmers. And then we see that there is an excessive use of water. Water levels are dwindling, salt water is coming up. Uh, we spray chemicals, we uh, throw around uh, fertilizers, all chemical. So finally, the soil is uh, mineralizing. Uh, we spray chemicals and there are no uh, birds or insects or animals anymore around. And then we speak about the green deserts where we only have to crop and the rest is all wiped out. Now, of course, that in the early 60s gave a uh, reaction um, and people wanted to go back 
to the organic and biological way of growing to protect the environment. And that organic and biological growing that started leading a an, uh, an separate life in the development of, uh, of agriculture and horticulture. But nowadays we see that the things are coming together the biological and organic are using technical uh, devices to uh, crick up their productions. And we see also that in the high-tech horticulture that the cultivation methods uh, are also more uh, environmental friendly. Science continues by the end of the uh, 1900s. And we see the discoveries taking place, especially in the protected cultivation. And people start looking in uh, the physiology of the plant and in the conditions, uh, how to, uh, the, the effect the, the conditions have on the plant. And then in the last 20 years, we are looking into what is called the plant empowerment, which is an stream of technology uh, to bring the uh, agriculture and horticulture on a higher level. And that brings us at the end to the controlled environment agriculture, the CEA. In the CEA, we say controlled environment. We control the humidity, the temperature, uh, in the soil, we are looking into the water quality, the EEC, the pH, uh, all these uh, parameters, all these factors are tremendously important to be able to grow plants in a proper condition. And that is what we have discovered nowadays, that if you want to have proper growth of plants, then you have to please the plant and not anymore what we did before, uh, dumping a certain quantity of one element or the other element. Now we have to understand that we have to give the plants what it is asking for and we have to understand what the plant is asking for. And then, of course, if you start looking in all the different factors, you want to know uh, what we are talking about. So you put the um, for example, the temperature, you put it in a range of 18 to 25 degrees. Uh, you put the nutrient level at a certain EC level, the balance of the nutrients, uh, the water quality, you have certain parameters. All that uh, together that create the data and based on the input of all the data and also uh, we come to that point of crop registration, we see that um, if we look at the plant and we understand the plant and we get data from the, from the plant, the photosynthesis, the trans evaporation, together with the parameters for climate and soil conditions, that we can almost grow autonomous uh, the, with, with the data. We can set uh, what we have to do to make the plant grow as, uh, as profitable as possible. Anyhow, um, we are talking about climate uh, control. We are talking about the, the plant. If we talk about soilless cultivation, then we are talking about the root environment. Uh, because if we control the root environment and we can give the roots the best possible conditions and we can give the plant the best possible nutrients, uh, pH of the water, and all these parameters, what we have mentioned before, um, then we are able to grow uh, without being in the soil, because the soil is a uh, reactive uh, material. So uh, it has a certain pH, and the pH has an influence on the, the capability of the plant to take up certain nutrients. Uh, the structure of the soil may lead to leaching of certain elements and then we create an imbalance in the, in the soil condition uh, in nutrients, in pH and other factors. To avoid that 
kind of interference from the soil, we have chosen for substrate growing, where we have a uh, material which is neutral, it doesn't interfere with uh, the chemicals, the, the chemical fertilizers we apply to the soil. Uh, it is an open structure, we can regulate the, the quantity of water what we're giving and create a certain amount of drain water. So we are uh, kind of in control what we are uh, adding to the plant and the plant is much more happy to grow in a substrate and of course it shows a higher production. There is also the possibility that you don't have substrate and then you go directly into the water. In the water cultivation, we have the deep water cultivation where we have a layer of uh, 20 to 40 centimeters of water that can be stagnant, but in the commercial way, it is uh, recirculating. And then, uh, of course, we have to control the water conditions um, and the roots are hanging freely in that water. We get a photograph for that later on. Uh, and the roots are growing without any resistance. Nothing is stopping them from growing. And that gives a boost to the plant. And the production in deep water cultivation is fast and high. In the NFT, the nutrient film technique, we have only a small film of water flowing under the plants. So we put, we put plants in, in rows uh, with a small amount of water which is con continuously uh, recirculating and the, and the roots are growing in that small quantity of water. And that is especially for crops like uh, cut green and, and lettuce a uh, very important uh, thing that they have continuously water and continuously nutrients. Then we have the ebb and fl flood system where we have a uh, leveled uh, extension, a piece of cement floor with borders where we put the plants on that floor and um, we can fill up with one or two inches of water. The, the pots or the containers can take up that water. It is, becomes available for the plant and once it is uh, taken up by the, uh, by the substrate in which the plants are standing, then the water is pumped out. The, the water out of the pots can drain out and fresh air can come into the pots because air is an important thing in soil as well. If we talk about a deep water cultivation uh, where we have uh, in, the, in the water fishes, normally we have then about 50 centimeters of water where we grow fishes, then there is a symbiosis between the fishes and the, and the plants where the fish takes advantage of the, the, the excavates of the, the plant and the plant uh, uses the excrements of the fishes uh, for their growth. Uh, of course, this is a very delicate balance, organic balance, uh, to continue growing, and it is definitely not the easiest way of doing so. And then, of course, we have the aeroponics, which is not very much in uh, use for commercial growing, uh, but we are still studying possibilities in chrysanthemum. Uh, we have done extensive trials, uh, if it is possible to grow, for example, chrysanthemum in uh, aeroponics, and from uh, GKVK here in Bangalore, I know that I have been studying if it is possible to produce uh, seed potatoes in these plants. Because a seed potato, you can seed it once, you uproot it, uproot it, and you have the potatoes. But if you're able to do it through this system, that aeroponics, then you can take the seed potatoes from these plants and the plant keeps growing and keeps on producing uh, more potatoes. So that are the, the basics of uh, soil cultivation of which substrate growing is very well introduced. 
Um, to put it a bit in a context, if we are talking about uh, soilless cultivation, then in agriculture, uh, we are not covering 10% uh, of the total world uh, agricultural production. Um, if we talk about substrate growing in horticulture, then we have definitely a higher per percentage uh, in the total cultivation against soil cultivation. And um, if it comes to water cultivation, it is almost negligent and it is much more under experiment than that it is largely uh, used as a commercial type of cultivation, although it is starting. <laughs> So the soilless cultivation in floriculture, because that was the topic of, of the talk, uh, but soilless uh, growing is uh, for all plants. And I think the soilless cultivation is a more important aspect. And we can find out for the floriculture, what can be grown in, uh, in substrate and what can be grown in water. And then we see, for example, that uh, substrate Growing is already going on for decades to grow uh, roses everywhere in the world. Uh, in India, we have had the first substrate cultivation of rose uh, at least 20, 25 years ago. Uh, it has not taken off yet, but there is definitely a good opportunity to do so. To do so. Uh, Gerbera, we know that uh, together with Carnation, for example, uh, they, they have root diseases, the Phytophthora, the Fusarium, and for these plants it is definitely a an, an thing to look into if uh, substrate growing is giving a higher production and less uh, mortality in the plant, especially after the first year. Um, if we want to grow the same as we grow um, cut greens, then we can make uh, beds, uh, one meter, one meter fifty wide, and with let's say ten or twelve centimeters of uh, of substrate, and then we can grow the uh, short crops like a chrysanthemum, which is only a question of a couple of months, uh, anthurium, a flower which is not very much introduced yet to 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 India, but which has a good potential, and eustoma, which is a uh, very difficult crop and would grow much better in substrate than in soil conditions. In the hydroculture, uh, we have uh, the problem of support to these plants because chrysanthemum and anthurium and eustoma, carnation, all these plants, they need support. And if we're working on a hydroculture uh, system, then it becomes a bit more difficult to, um, to grow these plants in that system. Having said that, I remember that in the 70s in Spain, I was already doing the first uh, trials with uh, Gerbera incarnation in NFT. And that was giving a result, but at that point of time, it was not sufficiently developed to make it a commercial, commercial venture. Then always the question, why should we do soilless cultivation? I have mentioned that the interference of the soil, the soil conditions, uh, it makes it very difficult to have a control over the root environment if you grow in soil. And if you grow soilless, then you're able to control the environment if you do your job properly, and you can create conditions for a much better plant growth. If I say you have to do your job, that consists of maintaining the parameters within the ranges according to the crop and according to the crop stage. And then I shuffle them a bit around. If you talk about uh, the climate, we're talking about air and temperature, humidity. If you talk about the root environment, the electric conductivity, the EC, the water quality, the pH is very important. 
And if you talk about uh, hydroculture, uh, deep water and NFT, then you have to look into your ORP, the oxidation reduction potential. Uh, you have to look into your uh, dissolved oxygen and uh, the formation of biofilm. And that is what you have to handle with the tools you have on hand and we come to that later on. What are now the opportunities and advantages if we go to grow on substrate and on, um, on water? Now, very simple. Uh, you get a higher production all under the assumption that you do everything correctly. You have a higher production and in many cases much higher production. Not only that, but you make also healthy plants because you're uh, adding the right nutrients so you don't have any deficiency, not even hidden deficiency in the plants if you handle it pro properly. And if there is any deficiency, you're very quickly in rectifying that. When you have healthy plants, strong plants, they are more resistant to pests and diseases. For example, you can make the cuticula, the, the skin of the plant, you can make that much harder with silica or with an extra dose of uh, potassium. And if the, the skin is harder than diseases, fungal diseases, bacterial diseases, uh, have less hold on, uh, on the crop and pests are also not very pleased with a very hard skin. You get a um, uh, lower cost because of the reduction of pest and disease uh, chemicals and you get a more healthy product, more clean product. That is the, um, the uh, in, uh, environmental friendliness of the system of growing in substrate. The other advantage which has not been much spread out in uh, India and also in Kenya for certain reasons. That is that you can start with large plants. In the Netherlands, they are planting tomato plants and capsicum plants, which are already at least half a meter, two feet high uh, when they start the cultivation. So they reduce the um, reduce the, 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 the period of cultivation uh, at least by, by one month, it is cheaper to have the plants at high density in a nursery than that you have them at a much lower density on a larger uh, area of cultivation. Of course, there is no uh, soil works involved and there is no weeding involved in the uh, substrate growing and the uh, hydro growing. As mentioned now, uh, several times the medium does not interfere with the nutrients uh, so uh, there is you, you're able to have a much better control of your root environment to a certain extent there is also less problem with soil borne uh, diseases although I have to say that uh, petium is still during the whole period of the crop is still something to keep an eye on. Nematodes, of course, are not necessary in, um, in the substrate growing if you do the things properly. <coughs> then economically, uh, you can change in hydroculture a crop you can harvest in the morning and in the evening a new crop is growing uh, in your hydroculture system. And if it comes to substrate growing, uh, an acre of uh, capsicum can be taken out of the crop, out of the greenhouse, and a new crop can be into the greenhouse in not more than a week time, disinfecting and everything included. There is no soil work involved into that. A small thing what we have in soil cultivation is that especially during monsoon time is that we uh, leach fertilizers, we lose fertilizers through leaching 
and that is what we don't have in the substrate growing. And then at the end of it, the bottom line, we have a lower environmental footprint. What are now the demands and disadvantages of the system? You see here on the right on the photograph what I mentioned before, a lettuce plant which has been grown in a uh, 35 centimeter of water, uh, recirculating deep water uh, culture. And you see the tremendous amount of roots which has grown freely. All these roots are taking up nutrients and that makes the plant growing much and much faster. There is, of course, a higher investment, uh, especially initially, not every crop, but initially, yes, because uh, you have to supply precisely the nutrients and the acid uh, and other materials into the water to get the right mix for the plants. And for that, you have to invest in an fertigation unit, a unit which is able to give, uh, indicated on an inline uh, EC sensor, the right quantity of fertilizer and uh, through an uh, inline uh, pH uh, sensor, uh, the right amount of acid to have the pH on a uh, specific uh, value. If you don't circulate in uh, substrate growing, then of course you lose a lot of uh, water and fertilizer because you drain out 15-20% um, of your water. Now, if you have open field cultivation, then you can use that water for fertilizing these crops which are less demanding in precise uh, fertilization. But Otherwise, you have to recycle the water, which is not so much of a difference. If you drain out in an open system, you also have to collect the water somewhere. You don't let it flow in your greenhouse everywhere. Uh, so you collect it in a an, in an tank. Uh, if you put a motor in the tank and you put it back into your uh, fertilizer tanks, then you have a closed system. Of course, if you have a closed system, then you have to have a certain disinfection of water. Normally, a UV system will be, uh, will be the, the system to disinfect. During the period of growing, um, we can check the water on the EC and the pH and keep an eye on it. But... Uh, kind of frequently, every month, every six weeks, it is uh, recommended to take drain water to the laboratory for a precise anal analysis, because certain elements will go down quicker than other elements, and that has to be adjusted once in a while. In hot climates, then we are talking about India, for example, uh, the temperature in the, in the substrate can be higher than in soil and only with cool water uh, we can bring the temperature down and uh, that is a disadvantage of the growing system or it is an extra investment to be able to control the temperature of the water. Then what we saw at one of the first slides then we have the, the challenge and the challenge is the management. Now, what do you need for managing a hydroponic system? Of course, you need a fertilizer recipe, but you can pick that up from uh, experienced growers. You can pick it up from universities. Uh, there is a standardized recipe for most crops, current crops, there is a standard fertilizer recipe. So that is what you have to get hold of. Then you have to establish the parameters, the temperature and the humidity, uh, light. Uh, these things are important to have them under control. And that according to the crop, the stage of the crop. Then if you know these parameters, 
you have to achieve them and you have to adjust them if necessary to keep them in these ranges. And to do that, you have to collect data. You have to uh, record the, um, the temperature 24 hours a day, the humidity, that all these data, you have them on hand. You have to look at the crop, what the reaction of the crop is. You have to take care that the parameters are within the data. Uh, data in, sorry, the parameters are into the ranges. And then uh, by collecting the data, you can check yourself uh, how you're going with your system. And then, of course, an important and new thing is um, the crop registration. You can look at the crop and you can see as an expert if the crop is happy or is not happy. If you do crop registration and you measure, for example, the, the length of the internodes, the size of the leaf, uh, how many fruits you have on a plant, how many flowers you have on a plant, if you take note of these things of sample plants for uh, once a week, then you build up a uh, kind of a visible development in the plants and you can revert back later to that. Uh, if you know that a certain uh, distance was between the leaves, the, the, um, the internode was a certain 10 centimeters or 8 centimeters, uh, then for the next crop or the next period of time, you can check if the plant is in that same range or that you have to take action to reduce or uh, elongate the, that, that distance. And a few words about the installation, because there is where I have seen uh, quite a few uh, mishaps. Uh, in the substrate, we use quite a bit of amounts of uh, cocoa peat. And cocoa peat is available anywhere in the country, in the, in the southern part of India. Uh, but... Uh, not all the cocoa peats are the same. Cocoa peat is collected from different sites, uh, then they are mixed and they're treated. Uh, it depends very much on the age of the crop of the, the cocoa peat and uh, also the way it has been treated. So going for a, a cocoa peat substrate, you have to be aware what are the characteristics Let's say so much fiber, uh, so much uh, dust. Uh, you have to have a proper uh, drainage in the back. It shouldn't hold too much water, especially in the lower part. It should be too much decomposed. Uh, the aspects are very important when you go and grow in substrate, uh, which is cocoa peat. The drainage, and that is why I have put uh, some photos here on the right hand side. In the first one, you see uh, the bags standing in the in the tray in the gutter, and there is nothing underneath. So these plants are standing in water. That means that the bag in the bottom is always wet. Very dangerous for uh, development of, for example, petium. On the right hand side, you see that in this case, we have taken a quick action and we have put a brick under each back so that there is more outflow of the, the drain water. And in the middle, we see the normal professional way of drainage. You buy a gutter and you buy a uh, material which uh, allows the, the, the troughs and the, the bags, grow bags, to drain out and flow out uh, without keeping water to the back and in the, in the bottom of the back. <coughs> For the controlled nutrient supply, I have mentioned that you need a uh, fatigation unit to control that. 
There is no way that you can do that with centuries or manual. Uh, you have to have a proper machine to uh, to look after that because you're giving water five to eight or nine times a day and you can't handle that manually. The filtration and in case of the recirculation, the disinfection is very important. Filtration means that you have to have a screen filter and disc filter and you have to clean the filters uh, regularly. And then the collecting and registration of data uh, that is done with uh, probes, the pH and for the, for the EC, uh, with sensors for the temperature and the light, uh, whatever you want to register, you have to do a certain investment uh, that you're able to collect this data because without data, you're not able to grow in a proper way. I would like to leave it with this information. Um, if you want to go for substrate growing, as mentioned, driving a car, you can't just teach yourself to do that. You need some support uh, either online or uh, visiting once in a while to see your, your cultivation and getting the right information from the right person. I thank you for listening to this and I hope that it has a positive effect on the development of the soilless cultivation in India. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Robert. Thank you. Thanks for a nice good presentation. And uh, you. would you like to do some explanation on the questions late as a later session or would like to continue? Ah, yeah. No problem, no problem. Yeah. If you have any questions, then uh, let me know. Yes, I, I do have uh, about five questions. Uh, I just made something. Okay. Uh, okay. I'd like to know what will be the shelf life of the flowers, which uh, are grown in hydroponics, and uh, what will be the difference between the soil-based one and uh, hydroponics-based flowers? Yeah. I, I have mentioned that in, uh, in my talk about the quality of the product, uh, you have with the control of the conditions and also the control of the, the root environment, you have the possibility to make a strong plant. And if you make a strong and healthy plant, then you get the best uh, possible product out of it. So uh, if you uh, use too much uh, nitrogen, for example, then you will affect the quality of the product and also the shelf life of flowers in this case. So it depends very much on if you grow correctly, then you will have a better quality flower and a longer shelf life. So it is 100% in the management. The system itself is able to give you a flower with better shelf life, but it is the management which ensures that it is indeed the case. Thank you, Mr. Robert. Uh, the other one is, uh, another question I'd like to put forward is, can sunflowers be grown on the hydroponic systems? Yeah, uh, we have seen that uh, in practice, we see uh, lots of roses grow on, on substrate. And it is definitely worthwhile to grow it on substrate. I think people is hesitant because you have to learn to grow in substrate. But uh, if I look, for example, in my own country in, in Holland, then I don't know if there is still any rose growing in the soil going on or that it is 100% uh, substrate growing. In Kenya, definitely there are a number of uh, companies, large companies who are growing in substrate. In India, we have, let's say, very few of them. And I think that there is a tremendous potential. If we want to make a step forward and we want to increase the production, then it is high time, maybe with the help of research in universities and uh, horticultural department stations, to, uh, to help the growers finding the right 
uh, protocol to grow roses in this case in the in the substrate and i think that that would be a very very positive development uh, chrysanthemum are also grown in um, in substrate gerbera and carnations definitely i wouldn't grow carnations anymore in the soil and i think for gerbera it is the same thing but people need support for that because if we start promoting uh, to go in substrate and people do that on their own uh, without knowing how to handle it, then there is no future for that. So there has to be an, an extension of information to these growers if they want to do that. So, thank you, Mr. Robert. Uh, the other one is, uh, can uh, we avoid seed-borne diseases? And you are doing through hydroponic cultivation. I I don't know exactly uh, what we mean. I have seen that question. I don't know what is meant exactly by soil borne. I understand, and that is what I have mentioned. That is uh, avoidable uh, largely in uh, substrate and hydroponic uh, or hydroculture uh, seed borne. Uh, nowadays, most of the seeds are properly treated, disinfected, and they are not, not carrying any, uh, any diseases. So uh, seed, seed borne, I, I don't see that that is an, a problem at all, whatever system. Soil borne, definitely it is an advantage to be in, um, in soilless growing. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. That is... Uh quite an explanation. Yes, of course, currently you see all the seeds are well treated, but just in case <laughs> some genetic mutations come in the form of a disease, I was wondering. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, now that, then the system has no effect on, on that. If the seed yeah. comes with these problems, then we will definitely have that. And then you may even expect that it spreads faster in the, in the water, recirculating water and in the substrate than that it would do in the, in the soil. Yeah, that's true. Thank you. Uh, the other one is, uh, I mean, if, when you are uh, in the, the cut flowers, when you are selling, when people are marketing and cut, flower, cut, cut flowers, and, uh, how do you increase the, the, uh, the vase uh, life of uh, the cut flowers? the waste, when I mean, they put it in the waste to sell it, is there any uh, options of uh, increasing their life? So, yeah, definitely, yes. Uh, it, we have mentioned that uh, in, in the substrate, you're able to make a better quality flower, and then we come into the, the procedures of post-harvest, which is as quick as possible in uh, a cooler uh, condition than in the greenhouse. So not harvesting all flowers and then after a couple of hours uh, uh, taking the flowers to the, to the cool storage. That has to be done much, much faster. Uh, harvesting earlier in the morning is a very positive thing if possible. Um, and then uh, before shipping the flowers, uh, in boxes, <coughs> excuse me, uh, shipping the flowers in boxes, it is very important that the pl plants are cooled, the flowers are cooled down. Uh, I hear quite often the comments that, yeah, in the, in the bus or in the transport, they're getting anyhow warm, but if you start already with a flower of uh, four or six degrees, then at least you make a good start that the flowers arrive uh, in the condition uh, better, talking about the local market, than that you do that without cooling. And if it is for export, well, uh, there is nobody exporting and not putting proper cooling pro uh, protocol on the flowers because they, they would be reacted on the other side. Thank you. Thank you so much. And one last question from my side will be, what kind, what type of flowers can be grown under foriculture or cannot be grown under hydrophonic uh, systems? If we're talking about uh, 
een, een just so on the top of my head, if we grow in Strelitzia, I think that is a bit difficult, or you have to grow them in really large uh, 25 liter bags, uh, or, or that way uh, that you can do something. If you grow orchids, uh, there is no way that you can grow them into the soil, so you have to have a special orchid mixture to, to grow them. Uh, Anturium is another crop uh, which very few people are growing into the soil, so it is all sub substrate growing. I have mentioned, of course, the mother of uh, substrate growing is the rose, but also gerbera and carnation are coming in. I see a lot of new crops coming in. I mentioned the enterinum. People is asking for eustomas. All these crops. Also, for example, if you have a good quality status uh, limonium plant, uh, go into substrate, don't grow them into the soil. Uh, all these crops, they can be grown uh, in, uh, in soilless cultures. You have to see if it is a short crop. You have to go on a small quantity of uh, substrate, or you have to go on an NFT or deep water cultivation if it is a short crop, uh, let's say uh, two months, three months uh, crops, then you can also grow them in the, the soilless culture. Um, if you have outside crops, then you can definitely, we grow trees in, in, in substrate, in, in large uh, barrel type of, uh, of cultivation, because they're easier to, to transport, they're easier to plant. And uh, we, we take a lot of uh, crops out of the soil and we put them in, in substrates. So there is a an, an tremendous scope. I would say you, 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 you have to think a little bit out of, the, out of the box and see what opportunities you have. Uh, the, the whole substrate growing is still very much in development, it is very dynamic uh, what is happening also in the soil, but especially in the substrate growing, there is a lot happening. And yeah, uh, if, you, if you follow the principles of that substrate growing, then you can grow a tremendous number of crops in substrate. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Robert. I think I'm done with my part of questions, but uh, we will compile a few more and uh, we will share it with you. And uh, your explanation would be quite interesting for our farmers. Yeah. On behalf of uh, Sudarshan, Dr. Sudarshan, I, I extend my gratitude for your presence and your, your good uh, uh, presentation. Thank you so much. We'll be in touch and I hope... Uh, we will be able to meet often on such seminars in the future as well. Thank you. Okay. Thank it you. was a pleasure for me. Thank you very thank, much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, let me share my screen and we begin. Yeah, floriculture and hydroponics. So this is one of the most interesting field. Uh, floriculture industry worldwide is now quite a matured industry. So we will talk about the global floriculture uh, scenario and uh, gradually we'll get into the technology part. Uh, before that, I'll just introduce uh, Flora Consult to you. Uh, right now, Flora Consult is engaged in sustainable vertical aeroponic farms. Our journey started with uh, floriculture. We were into export-oriented floriculture. Even today, we are very much involved in export-oriented floriculture projects. We have been engaged in setting up large-scale projects where we can grow roses and export 
and we have done such projects in india in east africa and also in middle east over period of time uh, the floriculture industry is quite stable and this sort of uh, technologically it's very much saturated a lot is still being done but the major uh, milestones have been achieved in that field but there is a new field which is coming up which is vertical farming and aeroponics where we have very less energy consumption less water and more productivity so flora council as on today is engaged in uh, vertical aeroponic farms both indoors as well as under greenhouses so that is uh, the field which is keeping us very much occupied we are working in various uh, new new modules and lot of research and development is being done in this field under flora consult banner now we go to our main subject that is overview of world floriculture industry we talk of international market uh, what we see uh, globally is that we have a uh, tenth of uh, flowers which are being traded among that roses being on the top that is uh, 396 million euro chrysanthemum spray is 117 million euro tulip is 84 million euro lily is 63 gerbera is 44 cymbidium is 29 calstromeria is 18 anthurium is 18 freesia is 17 and xanthedesia is uh, 16 million what we see on top is the rose is the king of all the flowers which is seen in this pie chart rose is everywhere the beauty of roses is it is in numerous number of colors there are thousands of rose varieties which have been bred by some very successful breeders uh, almost uh, for every color you can have hundreds of varieties a red can have numerous varieties a white can have numerous varieties a pink the yellows are there are different types of yellows oranges there are different types there are bike colors there are spray roses so we'll discuss about them in our next slides rose is the flower if you look at the consumption worldwide what you see is that us is the biggest consumer which is consuming 19% of the total uh, flower traded in the world after uh, us it's uh, a uh, japan japanese market which is 11% then germany uk france and italy so these are the major uh, consumer countries then east europe is another uh, big market which consumes uh, which is uh, ever growing and sometimes it becomes stable sometimes it grows but east europe is a stable market which is also there if you see one of the recent report uh, from netherlands which says that the market is going to grow with 6.3% cagr that is combined annual growth rate and uh, by 2025 and the main product which was uh, being traded was roses 31.3% followed by chrysanthemum which was 11.5% in 2019 and another trend which is visible and which is visible to us uh, since almost Two to three decades, that the rise of developing nations as major flower growers becoming a significant challenge for the Netherlands flower growers in both domestic and international flower markets. Uh, reasons are which we'll discuss in coming slide. Uh, coming slide, sorry. Uh, flower growing in Europe was mainly in Netherlands. Of course, in the past it was in other uh, European countries, but over period of time. Uh, when the gas was found in netherland which was one of the main uh, component of the energy for the greenhouse heating the netherland became the hub of growing with time the stringent environment norms high labor cost and above all the high energy cost of heating artificial lighting added on to uh, the agony of the growers because the cost of cultivation kept on increasing and the challenges of growing in the sub zero climate or at the very low temperatures during the snowfall especially when there is a huge market during the christmas and valentine time so that has prompted the third world countries or the 
other countries which had a better climate to get into this business. Same story was with US. US had a very good, a thriving uh, floriculture business till 1991, and uh, later on they they had signed one agreement with uh, South American countries, and certain duties were waived off for import. The idea was to uh, promote South American floriculture industry to prevent the drug menace which was taking place there. If I read this, in 1991, domestic blossom accounted for 64% of the nation's flower sales. That's the U.S. That was also the year that United States entered into Indian Trade Preference Agreement, which eliminated traffic, uh, tariffs on a number of products from Bolivia, Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru. Part of the war on the drugs, the pact had among its goals persuading South American farmers to cultivate flowers instead of coca that ends up as cocaine. Colombia in particular quickly flooded the American market with cheap, duty-free cut flowers, devastating the US industry. Especially in California, which supplied 75% of the nation's cut flowers before the passage of the ATPA, once home to more than 500 flower farmers, the state claims that just 200 today. Colombia is now the source of 78% of cut flowers imports to this country. In addition, 15% come from Ecuador, with Africa, China, and Europe making up the difference. I think we got traded away, says one of the growers in 1991 trade agreement. So this is the cost of a developed country sometimes pay when they want to put the developing countries into a constructive use. So the cocaine was substituted with class, but today the South American industry is one of the richest in terms of the quality of uh, roses which are being grown there. Also the technology adoption, the farmers have really learned the trick of the trade and most of the farms in South America are growing with great compliances of, to meet with the international standards. They are mostly, all, all the farms are certified with fair trade and a lot of flower label programs they have followed. This is a, a graph which you can see. The, the green is the imported flowers and the violet is the domestic flower cell. It's just uh, an indication of how the domestic industry collapsed in US. This is the place where you can see how the flowers are moving around the globe. And we are talking about roses. So this is the thick arrow which you see is from uh, South America, uh, Ecuador, Colombia, Peru, Bolivia. They are the ones who are now catering to the North American market. And part of it goes to Europe, and mainly East Europe, because the kind of product which they are growing is a premium uh, category. We have, they have very, uh, large buds, as uh, big as six to seven centimeter long stems. So they are being liked by the East European countries, especially Russia, Ukraine, and Poland, and all those countries. They love the flowers coming from uh, South America. And then you have the central one, which is East Africa, which is uh, led by the Kenyan uh, growers. Then Ethiopia and Uganda, Zambia, Tanzania are also part of it. But the king uh, in East Africa is the Kenyan uh, floriculture. They are into exports from Kenya to Europe. Then we have India, which is uh, not a big player. But uh, in the past, we had a very good export going to UK, Japan, Australia, Middle East, and uh, also the Southeast Asia. As of today, the domestic market in India has uh, grown uh, tremendously and uh, lots and lots of flowers are being consumed within the country. But still from India, the exports are quite prominent during the Valentine season and the Christmas time. Mostly between, say, December to uh, mid-March, there is a regular export. But even to Australia during the summers, and the Japanese market is also one of the regular consumer of Indian class, not to forget the Middle East. But uh, India itself being a big market, India has got that uh, luxury to sell a lot of products within the country. Unlike uh, our East African friends, 
their domestic market is almost negligible they face uh, issues when there is a uh, no big market in europe at times they have to even crush their uh, produce so they they face such kind of uh, situations so this is uh, the global scenario the consumption is all on the top countries and the production is mostly in the developing world and that is south africa uh, sorry south america east africa and india if you have to look at the top exporting countries so the netherlands is on the top followed by colombia ecuador kenya and ethiopia netherlands export is almost in the tune of around 4 billion uh, us dollar followed by around 1.7 by colombia and then ecuador and kenya kenya is around 600 odd million us dollar and ethiopia is 285 uh, million us dollar now we will look at the importing countries this is where there is something interesting you will see that usa is uh, of course one of the major importer then germany and third is netherlands as uh, we all know that netherlands is the flower trade hub including the they are grower but they are also one of the biggest hub for the flower trading they receive flowers from all over the world and then further distribute to the rest of the world so they have excellent uh, world's uh, biggest flower auction where flower reach from all the developing countries then it is quality control packed and then further uh, shipped into the different uh, part of europe also even the product come uh, back to dubai and also at times to india and many other countries so yes uh, netherland is the leader in handling the global flower trade this uh, a uh, chart is giving us an idea about how is the flower trade going throughout the year and uh, this is again specific to roses what you see in the red is the price in euro cent and the blue is the stamps sold here the interesting thing what you see is the week 4 week 5 week week 6 that is mostly falls under the valentine season and then when you see the last weeks of year that is uh, the christmas and new year these uh, red ones are going higher and higher that is the price goes as high as 40 euro cent on an average per stem that is per flower average goes to 40 euro cents so and also the demand goes huge that is stem sold in millions so Uh, the biggest revenue which the flower growers generate is during this period that is generally february and december of course uh, throughout the year there is consumption there is there is revenue generation and there is a demand the beauty of roses is roses are sold throughout the year it is not that it it is just meant for few events uh, because it is always a part of the gift bouquets so if you look at the revenue chart of flower grower you will find that uh, on your left is the percentage of revenue so almost 25% of the revenue is generated just say from 25th january till the 10th of february that is uh, we call it valentine window so this is the time whatever revenue is generated is uh, collected during the this period that is february and the beauty is that if uh, you the the roses can be planted in such a way that especially when you have cycles planned well you can hit the christmas market the next uh, same flush comes back to you in uh, month of uh, february that is uh, also the valentine market so if you can plan your flush well you will be having a win win situation you will be reaping the harvest on both the two key uh, seasons of the year the prognosis for exports till 2025 what we see is the global uh, flower industry is going to touch euro 9 billion though we have reached very close to 9 billion uh, even in 2021 so it, we are uh, we presume that it will reach even uh, around 12 billion by 2025 
because there is still a very good growth which has been observed in last three four years. If you look at the Indian uh, flower market, it is growing at the rate of uh, twenty three percent. European is six point three percent. We have seen Indian market is uh, estimated to be around eight fifty to thousand crore ru rupees worth, thanks to the lavish weddings we have and. Uh, the growing culture of uh, exchanging flowers. Yes, uh, even India is also being targeted as the import country. Right now, most of the celebrity events we get flood of imported flowers. Even uh, during the Valentine, we had few shipments of roses which were being imported in our country. So that is a new trend. India is one of the destinations seen by the global players. As one of the potential market for roses. Now this is uh, I have explained a, a lot why roses, but again, uh, as a grower point of view, there are again many points which we have to see. So why roses? Roses have been adjust the crop which provide highest return per square meter under greenhouses. This is a proven thing. Reason being, uh, and that is the reason world over, almost 70% of the greenhouse area is dedicated to roses. You go to all these countries in South America, East Africa, or in India, the rose is everywhere. And reason being that rose is a crop which has got very long commercial life. When you plant a rose in a greenhouse, it can give you non-stop revenue for seven years, minimum. If it is planned well, it can even uh, take you to uh, 12 years. We have uh, certain varieties which we grew in uh, Pune region in India, which has given us commercial life of 12 years. So no other flower can give you that advantage. You plant it once and not a single day passes without any revenue. You have some production every given day after you have started getting your first production. So that is the beauty of roses. That's number one. The planning can be done very smartly when you are growing roses. You can plan according to events, as I was explaining you. You can plan your Christmas. You can plan Valentine's. You can plan Friendship Day, Mother's Day. You know, you have yellow varieties which uh, sells well during the French Friendship Day. You can uh, plan all your yellow roses for uh, that particular period. The red roses can be planned for Valentine, Christmas. There, there are multiple uh, combination as a grower you have on uh, your crop and you can control the crop and you can feed the market as per their demand. So that is the beauty of roses. Roses are very good travelers. Shelf life of roses vary from 7 days to 15 days. If you maintain good cool chain, the roses can, can be... Uh, you know, they, we have kept roses as high as 25 days, even 30 days in uh, well sanitized uh, cold storages. But uh, on an average, we say that it can be 8 to 10 days to 15 days, depending on the varieties which we are producing. So they are very good travelers. They travel all the way. In next slides, I will show you the journey of a rose. You will be able to understand what I am talking about. Another uh, most important thing is the world market of roses is stable and it is growing everywhere. So that's why you have to have roses. Even you produce 100,000 roses from a given project, there is a market, there is someone who is ready to take. Unlike in other cases, when you produce a bigger quantity, sometimes you, you may fail to sell. So Indian market we have already discussed. An average realization per flower within the country, in India especially, is growing every given year. All the metro cities have become a big flower hub. They, they are consuming like, you know, city like Lucknow, Ranchi, Kanpur, Nagpur, Indore, Patna, even as far as you, you can talk of Shillong, Guwahati. These are all the markets which have now come up and they are consuming lots and lots of fresh produce and cut flower in general. Now we'll talk about how many types of roses we have. So mostly roses are divided into uh, four categories. One is called hybrid tea, where you have, these are the long stem roses, which has got bigger buds. 
but productivity is on the lower side but then they give you a better value in the market for per stem intermediates again they are a medium production and the stem lengths are 40 to 70 cm and they are uh, medium priced they are much in demand by the supermarkets and they are sold in again in hundreds of thousands and similarly sweethearts these are a small but plants uh, gradually the sweethearts space has been taken by intermediates but still there are some varieties which are prevailing so they have a potential to reach as high as 400 stems per square meter the certain varieties which are producing but mostly they are high producing and they are short stem varieties uh, we call them still supermarket and street uh, market uh, products and there is a niche product which has become quite popular which is spray roses where you have one stem and there are multiple roses grown on a single stem which we'll see in our next slides this is uh, just uh, an example of how flowers are sold in the market and how specific a grower has to be with his production because market's demands are very specific if you are a flower farm you may receive especially when you are dealing with a direct buyer he may give you an order say 20000 roses in that he will say the, the red variety he may talk 40 cm stem in its 1200 50 cm he requires 3200 60 cm he requires so many so like that for every color he will give you a very specific order so you should be able to fulfill his requirement because he has committed the same quantity somewhere else and what you see here like in this if you look at the mouse i am moving this is a just for an example a variety called aqua which is 40 cm it is being sold at 20 euro cent and 50 cm is sold at 26 cent 60 cm is sold at 34 euro cent and 70 is sold at 38 cent so this is the difference you see when you have a bigger the stem better the price in international market so bigger the stem means you have a premium product and small stem is lower cost but again there there are ways they they compare with each other you know when you have 40 cm they are light in weight so you have less freight to be paid per stem whereas the longer stem you pay higher freight when you are exporting them in international market so just for you to see how the specific the flower market is and how specific a grower has to be in his production uh, planning in india if somebody wants to set up a project and want to have an independent export oriented flower project the investment will start from 15 crore and above that's when he can have an independent project where he will be able to produce certain volume which can attract less air freight you know when you have a freight of 500 kg and above you get the better freight rates by the airline and when you are a regular export airlines will be giving you lower uh, rates because you can negotiate and when you are not having economy of scale then the freight becomes the biggest hurdle for anyone to export that's the one thing and then when you have a bigger project that's when you can hire the people who can manage your project smartly you can have experienced uh, production manager experienced post harvest manager experienced uh, market team so that's when uh, you can be an efficient project and from very first day you may not have a learning curve because that kind of investment has to be done with great perfection so that is uh, the category and then there is another one which we call 3 crore investment where you have say uh, 2 hectare 3 hectare project where in india you you can depend a lot on the domestic market and uh, plan for export or indirect export you may tie up with some export house who can buy or produce during the peak season and at times you can plan your production for say valentine and christmas so that is 3 crore and then 65 lakh is just one acre kind of farms which are okay for the domestic market what are the project uh, components what all a project involves so uh, these are the basic uh, criteria selection of land land development water reservoir to feed the the greenhouse uh, tropical designs then grow system this is the subject which we will be discussing hydroponics or soil based planting material the variety selection this is very important roses especially which we are talking about all the game is 
around the variety selection if you choose a good variety you can be the king at times uh, the certain varieties they look very good to you but they are not uh, very good for the market that is one of the most important thing plant protection system you do prevent the pests pests around you post harvest center refrigerator when electrical installations generators all these are the part of a typical project yes so that is the question question which is the subject this is the main theme of our today's webinar so now we'll talk about this which grow system to use should it be grown on soil or on hydroponic we need to consider that roses are long life crop in india we have grown certain varieties as old as 12 years which i was talking about with commercial viability as the soil selection or the proposed growing method plays a key role if we want to go with the soil imagine you have planted a rose plant and it remains on the same bed for 7 years so the soil quality soil structure is very important and the these are the criteria which one has to see when you want to select the soil the topography of the land there has to be a gentle slope which can allow water to drain off the type type of soil which you have to see the infiltration rate you know this is one of the key which decides if you apply a bucket of water on the soil at what rate it is being infiltrated whether do we require a subsurface drainage this is a typical uh, root zone scene which you see where you have a salt builder because we use drip irrigation drip irrigation forms an onion of water profile and uh, it always there is a layer of salt which is at the periphery of that onion which you see here like this so so now if you select the soil the clay soil the loam soil and the sandy soil each one has got a different kind of say drip irrigation system with different discharges you are supposed to uh, monitor it and a uh, lot goes into it uh, but the preferred soil for growing roses is loamy soil where you have good drainability and good control over the root zone if at all you have to choose which soil to be used so that is the loam soil which you are supposed to use and when you are growing in soil yes you have to be smart enough to keep the salts at bay and you should be able to play around with the root zone monitor the root zone by proper uh, measuring of the parameters at the root zone especially the salt uh, the the ph the ec and the soil moisture tension all those things have to be monitored very accurately if you have to grow your crop in a, the way your market is demanding at times when you have no choice then people go with subsurface drainage in say especially clay soil where the drainage is very poor but all this cost uh, can add on to your capex that's where you have to choose something which can be better so that is that's when uh, we talk of uh, getting into something which is not soil but it can be hydroponics now these are the infiltration rates so we are looking at 10 mm per hour which is for the low soils which is the best for going on the for the roses if you are going with the soil cultivation this is a typical problem which you face when you have a clay soil very poor drainage you have algae formation the water is not infiltrating and the crop is very crazy even here this is one of the farm where you can see that all the top layer is affected by algae uh, you have the green algae which you can see and that is the one which plays uh, hinders the the aeration and also the plant cannot grow very healthy and happy yes there are ways when you can you have good loamy soil you can have a raised bed you can cover it with proper mulching or you can still have very good crop if you have a good well drained soil and raised bed made like this so this two combination uh, if someone has got can be a winner even when he has got a, a soil cultivation yeah this is how you know it's all raised bed with very good uh, drainage system so uh, as i was telling you the so loamy soils are the best which is very good drainability aeration water holding capacity if the soils are clay a lot of efforts are required in terms of improvement of sub surface drainage hence in such cases it is wiser to go for hydroponics 
there are cases when very good loam soils are imported from neighboring field to improve the grow grow beds yeah there are people who sometimes prefer that they will not go with hydroponics but they found some very good soil available in neighboring fields so they bring the soil with truck lorries and then raise their uh, have the raised bed made on those uh, uh, better quality soil and that is also one of the option people follow but when we talk of hydroponics there has to be an advantage so we have seen that in, uh, uh, soil growing is affected by numerous factors and the grower has to maintain each one of them with full precision so lot of uh, burden on a grower even uh, you have you may have nematode soil based uh, uh, diseases which can come into the plants nutrient regime is a challenge every time because you have to keep on monitoring root zone commercial floriculture market is highly professional and growers have to ensure they fulfill the demand of the buyers in great precision flower orders as i was explaining you are very precise like so many stems of 40 cm 50 cm so grower has to have very good control over the growing and that is possible when you are in hydroponics so now we talk about our favorite subject that is hydroponics for commercial cultivation what are the advantages uniform and homogeneous crop growth because the soil is heterogeneous media if you have a one acre of a uh, greenhouse you take 10 samples of soil from different locations get them tested separately you will find variation in nutrient content of all the 10 because it's soil it's huge and uh, there is always possibility of variation whereas in hydroponics what you do you have a same media everywhere you are applying same nutrient everywhere so the strata is having same the root zone is getting all the same kind of treatment so the crop comes out very homogeneous very uniform the productivity in case of uh, hydroponics we already found that it comes almost 15 to 20% higher because the faster crop cycles the leaf lamina comes wonderfully well size is good and it's shiny stem lengths are under very good control better control over the crop growth by effective nutrient management sanitization of root zone and root borne diseases is very well controlled especially like the nematodes which we have discussed in the substrate cultivation we have better control in fact uh, almost we don't allow them to get in environment friendly because they are not getting into ground water water efficient because we are recirculating of course they are drain to west kind of design and they are designs where all the water is collected into a huge reservoir and then recycled after the uh, proper analysis and addition of the nutrient so yes uh, that is the method for all the large scale commercial better control over the production quality trends in stem length bud sizes ensures better control over the marketing you know the guy who is marketing for a flower farm he is always under pressure and if he fulfills all the orders which he is receiving from the buyers uh, the project comes out as a winner yeah there are certain myths about hydroponics when you want to set up a large scale hydroponic farm the the people say that it saves 90% of water as compared to soil based grow system it is true provided the source of water which you are using is of very good quality that is mostly if you have a, a big dam or a river which is flowing which has got a very low uh, electrical conductivity water quality is good that can be used directly for your cultivation so then you are okay but if you have false if it will be false if you are using a bore well water where you have a 700 ppm water coming out which has got very high electrical conductivity as i say 1.5 or 2 then uh, you have to go with an ro system and when you have an ro system that means ro is going to reject almost 30 to 50% of the water depending on the salt content of the water so that rejected water is something which can't be used by you so if you are pumping 100 liter 
you are throwing almost uh, say 30 to 50 liter out of it so if you say that hydroponic is water efficient yes it is provided your source of water is of good quality if you have to use ro then yes but still if you have say 400 300 ppm then very less rejection you can have and uh, you can recover by very good productivity and the quality of crop but uh, one has to keep this in mind certain places uh, you have the water requirement which goes for the climate control especially in protected cultivation when you are going with evaporative cooling system fan and pad it requires a lot of water so that remains common if, if it's you are growing on soil or you are growing on hydroponics the fan and pad is going to consume the same amount of energy as water So yeah, this is something which uh, all of us have to know. Now, what are the main uh, components of uh, typical uh, substrate cultivation? We have uh, the grow system, which can be a linear tray, or it can be pot, or it can be a grow bag. Then we, we require a precision drip irrigation system, not just just PC, but PC and D. PC is pressure compensating, but when we see PC and D, so pressure compensating with no drain or no drip. So no drain means if you have say 5,000 drippers in a given greenhouse, the moment you shut off the wall, all the drippers must stop releasing water, be it the last dripper in the row or the first dripper. All of them, they follow your command. They of uh, releasing the water. The moment you put them on, all of them will release the water at one go. So that precision is very much required. Then uh, recirculation and drain to waste, which we have discussed. Recirculation system is the best. Drain to waste, they are some smart farmers. They allow the, the drains to pass, but that drain is used for some other open field horticulture cultivation. And that crop gets benefited of the nutrient which are being released from the drainage of the flower farm. Then you require a very precision fertigation controller which monitors your parameters for every cycle which is being fed into the greenhouse. And then on site MIS, which is done by your managers. Now, various media is being used for growing. Cocoa peat is one of the most popular media. Then perlite or volcanic ash, we call it, which is now uh, more stable and uh, popular in uh, East Africa. Even in India, now people have started using it. Rock wool slabs, glass wool slabs, which are quite prevalent in European countries. And as we say, selection of media is very important aspect of substrate cultivation. Now we'll uh, take you to a typical uh, Dutch greenhouse system in Holland, how they are growing and how they are growing roses. You can see here, uh, it's a huge greenhouse which is made of glass. The first and foremost is the capex is very high, capital cost. They have to invest on the glass houses which are almost like a permanent structure because they have a snowfall, so a snow load has to be managed. So they cannot do away uh, with the typical polyethylene cladding material. They have to have glasses or polycarbonate sheets. The next is the uh, typical season, especially Christmas, New Year, Valentine, when the markets are huge, they start facing the winter. They have snowfall. They have very low light periods. So they have to supplement the lights. So that's the next cost they get. And these huge pipes which are moving around what you see are for the heating of their greenhouses. So heating is another big cost they have. This is a typical uh, roast uh, greenhouse in Holland where they have to use uh, the slabs and in the slab they are growing roses. And uh, yes, this is how it looks in Holland. So heating, lighting, and high labor cost, plus uh, at times they also do supplementation with carbon dioxide. So all this is the one which is making growing in Holland difficult, but 
our friends in Holland are very smart. What they do is they are also into the breeding of roses. So they have breed some very new novelties. So those new novelties which are fetching premium in the market, they hold it for their own uh, consumption. So those novelties, they fetch them better price and then compensate on the high cost of production. So yes, one has to be smart enough to have a strategy. They are following it very smartly. Now, uh, this is one of the farm where we, uh, we have set up in uh, Africa, where we were working. Uh, you can see there is a reservoir, huge reservoir. This is the reservoir which receives the water from all the, all the greenhouses for the recycling. And this is a almost 30, uh, five hectare project, growing roses for the international market. There's another mark, uh, project which is known as Prima Rosa. Here you can see the reservoirs. They are collecting the rainwater which falls on the greenhouse and also the, the drainage which is collected into a couple of reservoirs. So these reservoirs are the ones which receive the nutrients which are coming back after the drainage and the others which are receiving the rainwater which is coming from the top of the greenhouse. So it's uh, the quality of water which is collected from the rains is one of the best water. They don't require anything related to uh, RO or something. There is no need of treating that water. Now, this is a typical substrate cultivation farm in uh, Kenya, where you can see that the perlite is being used. The media is perlite. And uh, it's not just perlite. There is a combination of cocoa peat and perlite with over period of time and with repeated research, we realized that this is the best combination because the cocoa peat does the job of moisture holding and bit of organic and perlite maintains the structure of the media because it's inert and it is it does not lose its structure. Whereas cocoa peat being organic has got tendency to decompose with time. So if you go with 100% cocoa peat cultivation, the life of cocoa peat is not much. It will be uh, three years, two, two years, two and a half years, three years, start losing the structure. So this is a typical uh, farm where you have uh, perlite cultivation. You can see the crop is very rich. One of the leading uh, technocrat from India who is working in Africa, is adding one of the largest flower group there as a managing director as one well today. He is showing you how healthy and fast growth you get on this combo of 30, 70 cocoa peat to perlite. <clears throat> now we talk about substrate cultivation in India where uh, we are using uh, cocoa peat as uh, one of the media. You can see the compressed cocoa peat pills. These are all washed cocoa peats with a good granular structure and the electrical conductivity is very low. Here our model is different. Here we try to uh, also save on the capital cost by formulating a method which can also generate rural employment. You can see that we have got SDP sheets which are being now converted into uh, grow trays and this all rural youth which is engaged. So there is a frame which is made of MS bars, which is again done locally. We have hired local uh, welders and fabricators. We bought the steel and also got the SDP sheets and formulated this because it's a huge project. So if you do formulate your project with this kind of appropriate technology, you save on the cost. And this is how it is uh, placed and the cocoa peat is filled in and the planting is done. Here uh, and the, below the trees, we have half cut uh, PVC pipes, which are using as a collector for the drainage and drainage is collected and taken into a reservoir. And again, it is reused. Yeah, this is the wonderful crop from the same greenhouse when the production is in full swing. You can see that Flowers are seen everywhere. Now, this is something which has been planned for uh, Valentine's season. These are all 
red roses they have been capped the capping helps in uh, raising the bud size of the flower and also uh, in production planning and also it does protect the flower bud from damages while it is being shifted from greenhouse to the post harvest center so this is a typical indian uh, farm another farm where the similar kind of system is being used another difference what uh, you can see here is Uh, the trays are made two meter long. The advantage here is, uh, you know, there is like in Kenya, you have seen that there is a long trays, and if uh, there is a, an issue of some disease, it can spread into all the entire tray. Whereas in this case, we have two meter tray, so if any issue comes in, it can stop at just one tray and it won't spread. That is one advantage you get in this. yeah so this is a typical uh, hydroponic farm where you can have very good control production homogeneous production now this is a basic uh, greenhouse fertigation center where you have nutrients mixed in a b and c and injected in a given proportion to various greenhouses you can see the tanks there and it has got a a uh, routine analysis has to be done by the agronomist who is working in the greenhouse this is something which has to be done in a very routine way of course they are uh, uh, you have a controller which is giving all the data but it has to be time to time calibrated and cross checked by the managers who are working in the greenhouse you cannot all the time depend on the growers the controllers this is a typical uh, control room where you have a controller and a display which is giving you all the time every 5 minutes you get the data that which greenhouse is being fed how many cubic meter is being given that plan is given by you only what is the electrical conductivity what is the ph what is the solar radiation getting into that greenhouse what is the wind direction wind velocity and also the rainfall which we have temperature you have humidity you have all is being fed into this computer and it is fed every 5 minutes so the day the project inception after say 3 year 4 year 5 years time you want to see how the monthly climate is varying you can relate it with your productivity you can relate it with your uh, water consumption also the nutrient consumption all that can be related when you have this kind of parameter available with you we have uh, certain simulations done we have made certain formulae on that basis that you know if you have solar radiation in certain month of say february what was the water consumption what was the production which we received in last 5 years in the same period if you see if you can relate all your uh, crop production and the consumption based on the radiation which you are getting so so many uh, variables can be studied and based on that you know these are the tools for a grower or agronomist based on that his experience is he gains experience and he plants and based on that you can feed the market right point up quality and quantity and also uh, you can predict the production because product production prediction is very important there are times you know the marketing guys they start getting the orders for christmas and valentine maybe 6 weeks in advance or even 2 months in advance 3 months in advance the grower has to be smart enough to give the assessment that this is what he is going to get not just number of uh, flowers but variety wise stem length wise that this is what i am going to produce so smart growers they generate those capabilities by having controls and study over the various various parameters and variables which are being fed into these computers so these are the tools and how smartly a grower agronomist make use of them depends on his capabilities this is another farm a similar kind of system we have abc and then you have all the monitoring and there is you can see this the computer which is receiving and storing all the data this was somewhere in gujarat 
So now I was showing you the hydroponics in Holland. You have seen in Kenya. Now you have seen in India. As I was telling you, we believe in. We have to see hydroponics is what we are trying to maintain the crop by feeding through the roots in a very defined way. We want to keep the root zone of the crop very happy. So what uh, the soil was not giving, we are giving. We are maintaining a very good balance, maintaining good aeration. And that can be done by a proper uh, uh, grow system. It can be a grow tray, it can be uh, very expensive trays, or it can be just uh, which you'll see in the uh, next slides. You can see this very simple. We have cocoa peat. Here we were mixing, uh, mixing the thermocol uh, balls into it to maintain the aeration. So this pure cocoa peat with thermocol balls into it. And half cut pipe, which, which you can see here, yeah, that is the meant for collection of the drainage, which is coming down from it. Yes, this is what I was talking about. This is again hydroponics. It is on substrate, but the cost of capital is very low because you have a greenhouse, which is made of wooden greenhouse. You have a stands, which are made of bamboo. And you have a tray, which is made of very simple plastic. So you have same result, you have full control over the crop because you have the root zone at, at your will and the, which is good for the crop, but the capex on the lower side. So that is the advantage of uh, developing countries. We can always develop something which is based on the local requirements. Here, another advantage you see here, we have earthen pots. Now, when you have temperatures reaching 42 degrees, 43 degrees, and you have a plastic tray where you are growing, the temperature in the plastic tray is, uh, reaches very high. You have seen in the previous slide that we were using white and black. Uh, the, the plastic trays are uh, white from outside and black from inside. That does a bit of cooling at the root zone, but there is nothing which can substitute the earthen pot. The earthen pot with the perlite and cocoa peat can be the best combination for someone to do uh, substrate cultivation in India. Reason being, the artisans who make the earthen pots are there in, spread all over the country. And they can make the earthen pots for you and you can use this. In summer, we have seen that the crop which is grown on earthen pot was far, far better than which was being grown on a uh, plastic SDP grow trays. And we are using bamboo as a stand. So that is another the cost effectiveness. And when you have bamboo, it does not add into the heat radiation. When you have steel, it's, it's also part of, it emits certain heat. See here, this is rain to west type and a very low micron uh, plastic was used made of uh, bamboo support. And rain to west, then you, have, you see the drain below. So all the water which falls gets into the drain and then taken out, used for the other horticulture crop on the outdoor cultivation. So these are the basic uh, structures which we use for our commercial hydroponics or large scale farming. The main theme is that the project has to be planned in such a way that it sustains, it becomes viable, it produces the quantity and the quality which can generate revenue and the profit for the grower. So the formulation has to be based on that. You know, the if you go with wooden structure, yes, there is a life to it because these are wooden things. Even the wooden greenhouse has got a life because there is a time the wooden wood may get decayed and it may crash. So the revenue model should be such that within two, two years to three years, you will recover your money and start making profit out of it. That's when uh, this model can be very handy. Otherwise, it's better to go with something which is permanent, long-lasting. When you go with a well-defined frame, the life is 10 years, 15 years without any problem. So that should that depends on your strategy, what strategy you have for the project. Yeah, so this is a typical... Now we'll take you to the journey of uh, rows from the farm to the market. So this is how you can see the very lush, shiny foliage you get out of it. 
the production comes in a very uniform way which makes your life easy when you are exporting to international market the japanese market or the european market any market when you are exporting you just cannot export without showing your buyers how you are producing all the buyers they would love to come and see your technology they would like to see how you are growing are you following all the compliances their certification which you are supposed to follow all that uh, they look at and based on that they give you a rating and you start exporting the product these are some of the japanese buyers who are a regular buyer from india and they prefer indian roses a lot a typical soil based project where someone has got very good quality soil from outside so this research which we did was to compare the soil based cultivation with hydroponics the objective was to grow same variety plant them in the same day and then compare you can see this lovely raised beds with very good drainability and on the other side you see is hydroponic system where we have got a grow trays so we had planted roses on both the sides on the same day same variety and in the same greenhouse same climate was maintained just to see that how the crop performs so the difference is what we could see in both was that the flush between uh, the the recurrence of flush was faster in case of hydroponics in soil it was taking say 52 days whereas in hydroponics it was around 45 to 47 days so when you have faster flush means in a 365 days you can have more number of flower flushes and that enhances the productivity per square meter at the same time we were getting very uniform production whereas in soil we we were getting heterogeneous like the center stem will be uh, bigger and the side stem will be smaller but here we were maintaining almost a uniform thickness of the stem which is again one of the criteria when we are exporting the crop should be homogeneous also we have done research on different kind of media like we also tried crazily growing on sugarcane bagasse then we used uh, sawdust we mixed sawdust with uh, coco peat and perlite but we found that the best combination is always perlite with coco peat a uh, 30 70 uh, 40 60 is what you can always play around but that is the best combination we have uh, researched and we found that this is all uh, result of our action research and yes that is what i have already spoken for the high temperature zone earthen pot has come out the best against the plastic trays and uh, the perlite and coco peat that is the best media to grow another advantage which we have compared with the soil based uh, project uh, where the same varieties was grown that was life of hydroponic roses is little better and that is only because we have a good nutrient management and the controls over the nutrient which plant is consuming so the, we can play with the better hardy products which can have better was life this these are typical hydroponic roses which are being now quality graded for the export you can see how uniform as if they are coming from a factory very uniform that is the key they should look very uniform when they are being exported the stem thickness you know they have to have similar thickness it should not be one stem thicker another thinner and stem length of course as i have explained you grading sorting and uniformity as you can see that all the flowers they look so uniform that is the demand of international market quality control bunch to bunch this is a typical shipment which we followed now it is being packed which you will see uh, we have followed it till the japanese market once it is packed it is loaded into a 
or reefer van and this is how it has reached in japan it has traveled from one of the city in gujarat to mumbai airport from mumbai it was loaded into a flight offloaded in japan in, in uh, tokyo from there again it was taken by a wholesaler took it to his warehouse and now he has opened it so it, this process from the date of harvest till it has reached to uh, the wholesaler in japanese market it has uh, already consumed 48 hours now it is opened the leaves are still fresh now they are hydrated they are removed and put into a water bucket the moment you remove and put them into water bucket they start looking fresh again they start absorbing water and you can see they are ready to be displayed into a flower market it's in it's been displayed into auction yes this is a typical uh, japanese auction where you can see the clocks which start from higher value to lower value so you know you can quote say 100 yen you know that your product could be sold at 50 60 or 70 yen so you say 100 yen the clock will start from 100 and start going downward and this gentleman who are sitting here all the they are all the buyers the moment they find that uh, they know you because you are there every day they just press the button when they find whoever pays the first gets the lot so whoever pays the highest will be uh, receiving the product the moment he is pressed the lot is sold the money is deducted from his account and credit to your account in the auction and you receive the money after deduction of the commission from the auction so this is a typical japanese auction we have similar auctions in uh, see this is a japanese auction which you have seen we have similar auction in germany and also the dutch flower auction which is one of the most advanced in technology these days uh, it's more online where people can bid from even by staying in other part of europe the clock keeps on moving and these are the magnetic trains which pass different trolleys and trolleys are the one which are people bid for the moment you bid as a wholesaler the trolley just moves in to your warehouse and from there you load it into logistic trucks and send it to different part of europe yeah this is the the hub of the global floriculture that is holland dutch auctions this is another world as i was telling rose is a big world selection of uh, varieties play a key role and variety selection is not just by color or something we have to see whether it will grow well in your climate so you have to keep on hunting for new varieties i'll scroll through various varieties just have a look so that you understand what actually goes into the field of roses these are the varieties which are being displayed by various breeders who spend their time energy for years and generations to come out with newer and newer varieties and for these varieties we pay royalty of as high as 1 euro per per plant which we grow in our greenhouses but it is uh, value for money if you have selected good variety which can fetch you premium in the inter international market like this is a sweet heart variety called viva which gives you production of 250 to 300 flowers per square meter these are certain numbered variety name is not given because under trial in one of the uh, breeders uh, showcase belay these are numbered varieties you can see this beautiful yellow which is still a numbered variety in 2004 but later on it got a name numerous varieties by colors yellow different different colors this is the way they are again displayed because each variety the way they open up also is very important opening of variety the how it looks the shape after opening because your retail customer when he puts into his flower vase in the sitting room the flower should look beautiful after it opens up so those are the criteria even the thorns how many thorns it has got the thorny varieties there are certain varieties which are completely thornless they again have got uh, 
tremendous demand in the market flashback these are various various varieties nice displays rose has got tremendous uh, possibilities even there are people who make them uh, colored by artificial especially the white varieties there is competition every year for the best variety yeah this is the one which in india right now uh, not none of us is growing that is spray varieties spray varieties are the ones where on a single stem we get 7 to 8 uh, flower buds and it's a, still a niche market but uh, in european market and also in kenya lot of growers are growing and uh, it is part of a portfolio when we have a portfolio of varieties in a given farm a uh, small 10 15% of spray varieties are also part of that portfolio because there are certain uh, wholesalers and the direct buyers they need these varieties yeah spray varieties numerous numerous varieties so selection of variety especially when who, somebody wants to get into an investment of 15 crores and above is the key and this being a fashion industry when you set up a new project always you go with something which is new and novelty so that when you get into the market you are ahead of your fellow growers who are still growing the old varieties as i was telling you rose is a long life crop which can last for 7 years and above so once somebody has made the choice it is not that easy to change those varieties of course people keep these this 20 to 15 to 20% always in a dynamic mode they keep on introducing new products but the main product is always is for long duration and long term yeah papagayo this is wonderful variety so these are the varieties which are prevalent in international market but indian market not many have been introduced reason is simple that indian market is not paying royalties to these breeders so they have lost interest and mostly in india right now we have mushrooming of small farms we don't have large scale farms which can uh, meet the international requirements very few international large scale farms are present so they are uh, okay with a lot of domestic market and international market but new variety introduction in our country as on today is not very much as thriving as in ecuador or in kenya because they are they are thriving they are having huge business revenues 650 million us dollar worth business so there is a good a potential to introduce new varieties whereas in india we are not into uh, much we are not into rec recognition for the export market so best thing is that maybe the indian breeders get in to breeding new varieties we have lot of rose breeders in our country but their concentration still into garden roses if they shift into the greenhouse based uh, roses yes this challenge can be met yeah this is uh, like value addition on a typical white variety a variety called avalanche which was value added by one of the grower and displayed in one of the flower show so many varieties in roses so many types so breeding is another big uh, business i was just giving a simple example or calculation if you have 5000 acres of roses in kenya and each acre we are planting 32000 plants an average royalty per euro is 90 euro per plant the total worth if the royalty is collected could be euro 144 million so uh, if somebody gets into the breeding and comes out with some very good challenging varieties this can be also a potential business 
especially those who have got a uh, skill of breeding roses i didn't get that could you try again we have a uh, international career there were certain questions i saw people wanted to know how is the uh, career opportunities so for everyone to know that uh, the east uh, african uh, floriculture industry which uh, there's almost 1000 million uh, dollar industry if you include ethiopia kenya uganda tanzania out of that almost 700 million dollar worth growing growing technical growing is done by indian professionals we have our society of indian society of floriculture professionals uh, most of the professionals they are under this umbrella and this uh, society was formed in 1991 when this industry was introduced in india so most of the technocrats who are from agriculture background they gained experience and gradually migrated to the thriving industry of east africa and today almost 70% of the projects are being managed mostly general manager production manager greenhouse managers the technical supervision technical consultancy is being handled by indian managers so and also the marketing there are a lot of uh, so many professionals who are engaged in marketing and procurement industry also so yes there is a great uh, potential for the careers in this field and uh, in india right now as a technopreneur you can be uh, an investor in this you can set up the flower growing project and uh, make it a profitable proposition because the government is promoting government is offering subsidy of 50% for the hydroponic uh, greenhouse projects for floriculture so yeah that can also be a good potential so i will conclude my session here and uh, thanks for listening to me i'll be happy to answer some questions on this thank you everyone